Good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Tischer with American Consulting Professionals, and I'm here today to talk to you about plans production and how that kind of fits into this new workflow of going from 3D to 2D. Now, before I dive into the plans production side, I think it's important to take a look at some of the recent updates to the CAD manual. And these updates just came out a few weeks ago, and there are some pretty important ones related to 3D modeling in there. The most relevant of the new sections to discuss is going to be 5.16 modeling standards. This section defines the overall objectives of the F.3D initiative and modeling requirements. One important thing to note here is that it states that modeling requirements will be determined at the district level for each individual project. So it seems like it's going to be more of a district by district and case by case approach, at least to begin with. It's probably one of the most important sections to us. It's going to be the ones that outline what can be asked of us in terms of a 3D model. Now, section 5.16.5 covers the various definitions of level of accuracy, which talks about you know, geometry tolerances. But as you can see here, you know, this is more about survey data and existing ground data, which is more for the roadway side, and something that we'll probably have to get some more information on or more detail in here for the bridge group here. Section 5.16.6 gets into the various definitions for level of development, which is sometimes referred to as level of detail. This is important for us because as bridge engineers, it gets us into the specifics of the element requirements which we have in our models. It goes from LOD 100, which is graphical elements with approximate height, volume, and location, all the way up to LOD 500, which is considered a, a digital twin, where elements are modeled and as constructed or even as built. You know, dimensions, shape, location, orientation are exactly as they'll be in the field. The last of the majorly relevant sections is 5.16.7.5. This states that if our LOD is less than 350, we have to develop 2D plans and details for full construction information. When our LOD is 350 or greater, we are able to, to develop all the construction information within the BIM model and the EOR is the sign and seal of the model. Now, the level of detail that we can achieve currently depends on the type of bridge we're modeling. For pre-stressed concrete girder bridges, you know, we can easily achieve that LOD 350 and really even the LOD 400 since the main difference between those two is just that we're attaching non-graphical data to the model elements in the LOD 400. For steel girder bridges, we can achieve mostly the same LODs as the concrete girder bridges, but there are some items like field splices and bolted connections that require a little extra manual effort. Um, you, know, you can't really produce some of that stuff in the out-of-the-box OBM, or it may require some, some different software as well. Okay, so what does all this mean as far as plans production? You know, how close are we to being able to produce 2D plans from the 3D model? You know, if you would have asked me that question six months ago, I would have said that we're pretty close, but not quite there yet. You know, ask me that question today, after the most recent release of the OBM, and all the work that's gone into the FDOT OBM workspace, I can safely say that we can indeed produce our, our typical FDOT compliant 2D deliverables from the 3D model. It's just a matter of understanding the differences between our old workflows and our new ones, and understanding a few important concepts along the way. Now some of these important concepts that we'll need to get our heads wrapped around, which may be new to us, uh, depending on the current plans production workflows. The first one is going to be model types and knowing what the different types are. So we have the design model, which you can think of as our, our model space, where all of our design geometry is stored. Next we have the drawing model, which is a space used to reference in our design model and apply annotations, dimensions, callouts, and other design aspects. And lastly we have our sheet model, which is kind of our, our paper space for any old AutoCAD users. You know, this model is used to lay out and compose the final annotated plan sheet. So what do the workflow differences really look like? Well, traditionally we've only used one model type for the most part, and that is the design model. The new 3D to 2D plans production workflow will require us to use all three types of models in MicroStation or OBM. Another important concept that you have to kind of put some time into or some thought into is you know, model management. So what is our traditional model management way in, in the 2D way? Well, we always have our, our DGN file, and inside that DGN file is a design model. And in the design model, we have all of our native geometry, our reference file geometry, annotations, dimensions, callouts, our notes, and our sheet borders usually scaled to fit the content. And as far as printing goes, we usually just print from the design model. So what does the model management look like in a model-centric workflow going from 3D to 2D? Well, it depends on the content on the sheet we're producing. There are a few different workflows that we'll likely encounter along the way. 
The first one is going to be a sheet with a single cut reference on it. Another one here is going to be one that has multiple cut references on it. And the last one is a sheet with cut references within other cut references. Now the best way I found to visualize this is with a flowchart. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because I want to make sure I get into the actual program and show you some of the deliverables we can produce and what, what we can accomplish with the model. Now in this chart here we have a couple different color coded boxes. First one is going to be blue for DGN, so this is going to be a DGN file. Black is going to be a design model within the DGN model. Gray is a drawing model within the DGN model. And white is going to be a sheet model. Now we're always going to have, no matter what, out of all three of those cases we talked about in the previous slide, we're always going to have that master 3D model, that master 3D DGN file that contains a design model where all of our native geometry is going to be stored in there. And then for each one of those scenarios we talked about, we're going to be referencing that into another DGN file. So in this case here, a typical section, I have a typical section DGN file. I referenced in my master 3D model here. I'm going to isolate whatever it is I want to look at on that sheet and into a design model. And then I'm going to make a, a section cut or whatever it is I need to create a, a 2D drawing model here. And in that drawing model, this is going to be where I'm placing all my annotations, my dimensions, anything like that. And then that then in turn gets referenced onto a sheet model here. And then this is the final deliverable, the final printable PDF plan sheet here. In that second scenario for that footing detail sheet, it's going to be kind of the same scenario where we have a separate DGN file. And in that DGN file is a design model, which is just referencing in that master 3D model. You know, nothing's new, nothing's stored in here. It's just a reference of this. And this is where we're going to be making any section cuts or plan cuts that we need to create our, our 2D content. In this case, I have a section cut to make a, a footing plan view, a footing elevation view, and then a footing column bar section view here. So I have three different drawing models that I've made cuts within the design model to produce these. And then all three of these drawing models then get referenced onto a single sheet model here to produce that final plan sheet. In the last scenario here, we have our, our peer detail sheet. So this is going to be, again, a separate DGN file, a peer DGN file. And in that DGN file, it's going to be a design model, just like all the other ones, with nothing native in there. It's just going to be referencing in that master 3D model. We're going to isolate that peer. And then the first cut we're going to make is that front elevation view. And then within that front elevation view, on the drawing model itself here, where it's a little different, is we're going to make section cuts on this 2D drawing model to create our column section cut one and two, our cap section cut, and our peer side elevation view. So these are those, you know, kind of cuts within cuts or sections within sections in terms of you know, the drawing models here. And then all five of these drawing models then get referenced onto this sheet model here, this final sheet model, which is our final plan deliverable. And the reason that we're kind of going through this and creating separate DGN files to create our, our plan deliverables is so that we don't create any kind of you know, production choke points. Whereas if we were just doing this all in this one file, then that's only one file that one person can access at a time. But by doing it this way and setting up separate DGN files and just referencing in that master model and then doing all of our, our 2D cuts and you know, plans production work in here, there's not going to be any of those production choke points. So we can have multiple people accessing different files at the same time and working on it at the same time. So let's jump out of the slides and go ahead and look in the, in the program and see what we can actually produce in terms of you know, 2D deliverables from the 3D model. So here we have a pretty custom peer on a job we recently did. But before we jump into the details of the peer, I want to show you how this ties back into that flowchart I was showing you on the previous slides. So open up the model views here. You'll see we have the couple different design models in here where I have different geometry to reference into. And then from those design models, I'm making section cuts to create my 2D drawing models like this. So this is a 2D cut from that 3D design model. And this is where I'm going to do all my annotation, all my dimensioning and everything that I want to see on that final plan sheet. And then from there, I reference this onto the final product, which is the sheet model here. Now this is a pretty powerful workflow here because as we make changes to that 3D design model, those changes are going to then propagate down to the drawing model and then to the sheet model automatically. So as I'm making changes, if I'm changing a variable for a beam seat here or my cap or my column here, you know, those changes are automatically going to update and my dimensions are automatically going to update on my plan sheets here. And I'll kind of show you how, how that works once I get into more of the details of this specific model here. 
Now let's go back to that design model here and see what it looks like. And this is something that is, you know, obviously a little bit more complicated than we're, we're used to. You know, we have cap steps and longitudinal and transverse direction. In addition to the beam seats here, we have a pretty custom rustication detail here, form liner with uh, chamfers on the inside here, as well as on the corners. You know, this is a, a tapering column and specific slopes on the, the cap and the column that we have to hold and maintain throughout the design process. So this is something that, you know, is a little more difficult than the other we're used to seeing probably, but it's also something that we can do easily inside of OBM or MicroStation. In this case here, I built this with a, what I call a parametric cell. So everything in this pier is tied to a variable, which I can update and change as the design process goes on. And then even use for repeat peers, you know, so I, once I build this model once, then I can use it for all the other peers in the bridge and then just update those variables to whatever the variables are for that particular peer. You know, so what do these variables look like? Well, it's pretty simple. It's all fully customizable. You know, these are all ones that I created here, you know, myself, nothing that came out of the box. And, you know, that's the beautiful thing about these parametric cells and these variables here is we can totally customize this any way we want to and, and for any kind of bridge job here. So let's go ahead and take a look at what it looks like in the model space and then the plan view or in the plans production view here. So on the right, I have my normal sheet model. Again, this is all, you know, F dot compliant. This is all built out of the F dot OBM connect workspace here, all fully dimensioned and everything already. And then I have my 3D design model over here. So this is really where the power comes into play because as I update things on my design model here, all my annotations on my sheet model are going to update automatically for me. So if I go into, say, the cap width here, change it from you know, 50 foot 6 inches to 45 feet. Notice my dimensions here are automatically updated for this. In this particular model, I didn't tie my, my steps to my cap ends, which is why you're not seeing them update here. But I could have easily done that. It's, just, it's a, something I saved time on and skipped over on this particular one. Go ahead and change a couple other variables just kind of get, give you an idea of what what it looks like when it changes in the design model here so you can see it changes over here and then those changes propagate automatically over to the plan sheet here as well so let's go ahead and change something like that cap minimum height so it's four foot dimension right here go from four to something you know a little larger let's call it maybe six feet and keep an eye on this dimension over here as you can see the changes automatically propagate all the other dimensions associated with that peer also automatically update because again, this is a fully parametric model. Everything's tied together based on the constraints that I built into it. Change just a few more, just to give you an idea. I'm gonna change this bottom column height here. Something a little more dramatic, we'll make it something like 12 feet. Again, keep an eye on this dimension here and all the corresponding dimensions. Change the 12 feet, all the plan sheet dimensions automatically update, everything updates in here. Again, because it's everything's fully parametric and tied together. Now, this is a, an iterative process that, you know, if doing it in a 2D way, we would have had to redraw this each and every time, which would have been more complex in this case here because I have to hold my cap slopes and my column slopes and, you know, truly would have required us to redraw this pier each time we wanted to try a different design variation. We'll take one last quick look at the corner chamfer here. Again, if I want to change this corner chamfer, I have a variable set for that. So I'm just going to change it from you know an inch and a half to something a little more dramatic, like four inches. And there you go. You see my column chamfer automatically updates in the model and on my plan sheet. Now, one last thing I want to touch on real quick is going to be the the rebar detailing. Now, this is truly where I think some of the the most usefulness and the most power comes from you know doing the model and, and the 3D model here. So I'm going to switch over to the rebar model that I have in here. So here we have the rebar detailed in this particular pier here as well and I will say that this is probably one of the more useful things inside but as far in terms of doing a, a 3D model here modeling the rebar. You know having spent time out in the field as a field engineer and a project engineer with the bridge contractor I can tell you that there are just an abundance of RFIs. You know, a lot of large percentage of RFIs always have to do with rebar. You know, a lot of them don't even make it back to the office. We just always figured it out or figured out a way to do it in the field. Um, but being able to model the rebar in 3D and check to make sure there's no clashes, everything fits together, is a, a huge advantage. I mean, it's just rebar is probably one of the most difficult things to visualize in the 2D 
in a 2D way. And so being able to look at it in, in 3D here to make sure that, again, there's no no clashes, everything fits everywhere, you know, bar placements are just right, all the dimensions we call out the plans are just right. This is just a, a huge advantage here. And this is just in the, you know, the 2D wireframe here. We can also look at it from a, a more 3D kind of render view as well. So we wanted to zoom in and make sure there wasn't any conflict on, say, the corner of this footer here. Zoom in, yep, that all looks pretty good. No conflicts, all my bars are fitting perfectly. You know, are there any conflicts with my, my dowels in here that are coming down from my column? Nope, those are all good. Look at it from a front view. All my bars are between my pile, I got plenty of clearance in there. And then say look at the you know column bars that are coming up into the bottom cap steel here. You know, did I space those out right? Do I have enough clearance in there? So you can notice here there's a little bit of clearance, a little bit of clash here, so I'll probably have to space those bars out just a little bit more or inset them a little bit more from the, the edge of the column. But these are the kind of things that we can find when doing the 3D model. So there really are just a lot of useful ways that we can, you know, use the model. It's again, it's not just that pretty graphical model that it used to be considered. It's now a, a single model that we can use throughout the whole life cycle and really save us a lot of time and a lot of effort. And that's all I have.